This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. This conversation is another cracking entry into the chronicles of filth. Ladies and gents, you'll hear from Woz Sargentson. If you are unfamiliar, Woz is Cradle of Filth's second ever drummer and also their fourth as he returned after Nick Barker left the group. Was recorded the majority of the cuts on the 1999 release DP from the Cradle to Enslave. Now, as regular listeners have come to expect, there is plenty of deep insight into the machinations of the group Was delivers. It's all on the table, and I'm very appreciative that he was willing to share his experience and observations from his time in the band and his ongoing association. In addition to Cradle of Filth, Woz was a part of Extreme Noise Terror, so he discussed his tenure in that group as well. For those listening via the podcast apps before the chat starts, you will hear the EP's title track from the Cradle to Enslave, and for those on YouTube, let's cut to the conversation right now. Let's go. I've always been intensely fascinated with uh, the era of Cradle of Filth that you're a part of, and I to set the scene from my conversations with people over YouTube comments from the other interviews and conversations, I should say, that I've posted, there seems to be two cohorts. There's people like me who grew up in the 90s who were there when Gen 2 black metal kind of first blossomed. So Emperor, yeah, yeah. Immortal, Satirical, Cradle of Filth, these sort of bands. And then we sort of yeah. dropped off, didn't we? And sort of life, you know, we got into our late 20s, 30s, now 40s. And I'm, I'm fortunate that I've sort of come back around in my 40s yeah. and I've been able to reignite my interest again, if you like. But there's a whole swathe of us that are sort of from that 90s era. And we have a very different take yeah. on Cradle of Filth than somebody who got into them post Midian, post 2000, if you like. The, the goth, totally, I call yeah. It, yeah, I call it the Marilyn Manson goth aspect of it, which I have yeah. no interest in whatsoever, <laughs> I must say. It doesn't, doesn't well, appeal uh, to my sensibilities. Yeah. yeah. And and as as we we'll, as we'll talk, it's um I can relate to what you're saying, but it's kind of different for me as well. But I I, I agree with you. It's um it's certainly um the people are into the scene back then. Mm. Well, even before then, there's so many different sort of takes on it. And it's like I always say, there's stuff that I don't like uh, about metal now, but that's not them being shit. That's me. It's 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 my interest has changed. Mm. It doesn't mean that just because I don't get it doesn't mean that, you know, all these people are wrong. It's just, you know, we evolve and <clears throat> it depends when you come across music. If you come across music at a certain time when you're young, it can affect you or or I in a in a different way than people. Um, what am I trying to say? Basically, I think when you come when you discover an album or a band, at that point, that album means something more to you than it does to people who've been listening to it for years. Do you know what I mean? And it's, so true. Yeah, it's, it's such a great point. It's, it's, yeah. it's weird. Mm. Your <clears throat> your involvement in Cradle is largely hidden, but is crucial. Okay, so to set the scene for the audience, people listening, you performed on the From the Cradle to Enslaved EP on the tracks, the track, the title track From the Cradle to Enslave, Death Cl- Comes Ripping, and also Sleepless, the Anathema cover. Now oh, yeah. you, you certainly had the pedigree to join Cradle of Filth. Uh, after working with Robin in December Moon and also uh, another killer release. I love this one here, the Extreme Noise Terror album, Damage 381. Uh, I've spoken, yeah, I've spoken to Barney about that album. Now, I, I, I want to cover ex- your time in Extreme Noise Terror too because you were part of a fascinating episode there for that group. But, you know, the, the reason that we have come Design. together, of course, yeah, <laughs> uh, it is Cradle. Now, just to give you some background, you've probably seen, though, that uh, I've had lengthy conversations with Stuart, with Nick, mm. uh, keyboard player uh, Greg Moffat, Ben Ryan, the original keyboard yeah, I listened, player. I listened to a bit of the, of the Ben one after you got in contact with me. I checked out. <clears throat> excuse me a little bit of Ben's yeah. um, podcast with you yeah yeah lovely fella lovely. very easy to talk to and gave a lot of mm-hmm. insight into those early days uh, a, awesome big, a, a big a uh, big entry in my uh, my catalogue if you like is the chat that I had with Paul Alendo although for Paul's own reasons we spoke for a couple of hours he wanted me to remove 
or not broadcast any conversation around Cradle of Filth. He just wanted to focus on his newer outfit. He's a funny, he's a funny fucker, bless him. <laughs> he's a lovely fella too, I've got to say. He uh, is. But he, oh, he, he gave is, me he some. Is, he is. He gave me some amazing insight into the group. I've got to share that. that I, I've got to say, I don't think anybody else would know. He just gave it all to yeah. me and then said, I don't want you to share that. And I will always respect that when I'm having conversations. Same yeah, thing with you, mate. Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 I, everything that I'm going to say, I'm happy for you to to broadcast. Unless I get to the point that I'm saying it and I'm like, actually, shit, don't, don't broadcast that. But <clears throat> there's no skeletons in the closet from my point of view. I think it's, you know, it is. I'm happy to talk about it. So. Mm. And look, and I, and I have had a superficial conversation with Danny for the show, but it was a part of a uh, the promotion for Cryptoriana, so we re- really weren't yeah. able to go deep. Okay, we're only able to no. talk about touring plans, album, and all the usual bullshit. Yeah, you know, absolutely, I understand. Yeah, your your name has come up a couple of times, and from what I understand, you are, you are considered a valued contributor to the group from the player's perspective, which is very important. Now, now my first question for you is, you, uh, as I've mentioned, you had the pedigree to be in the band long term. So did you, did you, were you bought into the band with the intentions of being there long term as a tenured member or were you just bought in for the studio episode? Right. So first of all, um, I was in the band, you didn't mention this, but I was in the band before they got signed. Originally, oh, okay. so just after the TFD demo, Darren Garden, the original drummer, left. I replaced him. I did um, maybe about ten gigs with them. Uh, the one of them's actually on YouTube where we supported Bolt Thrower. It was Bolt Thrower and Benediction, and us on first without blowing my trumpet or. Our trumpet, that was right at the time where Crater were just just about taking off. We blew the shit out of Benediction and Bolt Thrower. Both bands are great, but both bands were kind of uh, on a downward scale. Anyway, I'm, I'm di- and this was just after TFD and just before Principle. Now, we, were, we went into the studio to w- record what was going to be uh, an EP, a 12-inch, which would have came out before Principle. <clears throat> That 12 inch never, never happened, never transpired. And shortly after that, Nick replaced me in the band. I've stayed in contact with, with everyone um, throughout my travels since then. And for From the Cradle to Enslave, um, basically it was on the ropes. Prior, when Nick, Nick's tenure with the band was on the ropes. So just prior to that, um, Rob literally lived over the road and I was in contact with Rob. Um, anyway, for the December Moon thing, uh, and he was like, "Look, Nick's Nick's gonna Nick's gonna leave. There's tensions in the band. Would you be up for doing it?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course I would." So, but I knew that there wasn't. How am I going to say this? I knew that there wasn't much chance of that because they were literally playing a lot of shows um, and they had a lot going on. And I actually spoke to Faye at the time, and she was yeah. like, "Look, it's getting pretty hectic." Can you learn the set and just be ready? So that that to me was m- absolutely ridiculous because I'm not I'm not the same drummer as Nick, right? I, my feet were never that fast; they still aren't. Uh, so I was very realistic in what I can do or mm. could do. Um, so I just I looking back on it, it was ridiculous because, yeah. But anyway, so that was that was the deal. So I was on on standby, if you like. Uh, that 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 call never happened. Obviously, Nick stayed in the band until a point where he left, um, where they weren't touring or didn't have any shows um, planned. And then I went to do uh, from the Cradle to the Slave. Now I went in purely as a as a session guy. Um, there was to- I did those songs, which were relatively literal. Well, I think we had a week's rehearsal, and then we went and recorded it in Liverpool. Liverpool, Park yep. Street Studios. Um, and I remember having this conversation, again, where I'm sitting now in my house, you've got to get some context. Uh, we, we had Rob over the road. We had, um, there's a band called Annihilated from, from Ipswich. He lived across the street. We had Phil from Extreme Noise Terror just down the road. So literally, and Dan actually now lives around the corner from me. So this little square of Ipswich where I'm in, west side of Ipswich, 
was proper proper metal in those days. Anyway, I remember <laughs> speaking in the in a, a pub around the corner, and Dan was like, "Well, you, do, do you want to do it?" And I I had to explain to him. I said, "Look, it's been it was a good nearly ten years since my first time with the band." And I said, "Look, I can't I can't play like that." You know, Cruelty and the Beast is such a, I mean, it's a terrible production, but in terms of songwriting, in terms of what it is, it's such a monolith. It's such an awesome album. So my drumming style was very much, by that time, real real kind of straight ahead, sort of simple. I used to refer to it like Peter Chris, you know. Mm. I get the job done, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not bells and whistles like Nick was. I mean, Nick's playing and his uh, that whole extreme metal playing was something that I can, and I'm, I'll never forget Dan Dan was just like well it's just practice isn't it I'm like yeah it is just fucking practice Dan but we haven't got months for me to practice and get everything down it's not about it's just not possible you know and I remember there was a show that they did uh, at the Dynamo which was the the one that was the show that was upcoming and they got a guy called Dave Hersheimer to do that yeah um, correct and I, I've I've not heard the uh, recordings, but I remember Rob getting back and he was just saying, oh, it was just horrible. It was just terrible. But I, I, like I say, I can't comment on that because I've, I've never heard it, but I just love the naivety of Dan saying, well, it's just practice. And it just, you know, put a few hours of your day aside and learn the songs. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it is. But, you know, you've got tours, you've got an agenda, everything's in place. It's not as easy as that. So I was offered the gig, but I politely said, I can't do it because simply because I couldn't play like that. And I was honest with myself. I thought, you know, looking back, even looking back now, I don't think that I, you could argue that I could have put the hours in and worked hard. Yeah, sure. But, you know, as a drummer and as a fan of that type of music back in the day, I know how meticulous these drum spotters listen to things and they're like, oh, because I remember when I played in the Blood Divine, I used to get these people coming up to me after gigs because I never got any women because I was a drummer. And I'd get these drum spotters coming up and saying, oh, yeah, well, you did that differently then than you did on the album. Why? And I'm like, I don't know, mate. I've had a few pints. I just went up and enjoyed myself. I'm sorry yeah. that I played that fill wrong. but that, So I was very conscious of that. Um, but, yeah, so that's how that worked out. Um, obviously, I'm really pleased that I got to do the EP with them. I don't think that it's... <clears throat> I don't think that my work in, musically holds a candle to what Nick or what Adrian did, but I think that's part of its charm, you know? I think the part of the simplicity of it um, and the fact that it's that one of their most popular songs, you know, I'm, I'm pleased. So, yeah, sorry to ramble on around your question, but that's basically long and short of it. No, it's awesome. No, ramble as much as you like. Um, I've got to give you mad props, So I remember when I first heard uh, from the cradle to enslave, I remember thinking, "Wow, doesn't Nick sound different? He seems to have done so. He's got more of a D beat thing going on, you know, you know, this sort of thing." And I loved it. And then when I found yeah, out it was you, <laughs> Red. You, you got... No, sorry, no. That's funny because you mentioned the D beat thing. There's one thing that I've never been able to do properly is a classic D beat. And I remember when I was in ENT. I tried to sort of work it out and I'm like, nah, uh, uh, that's it, isn't it? And Dean would be like, no, that's not it. So the Slayer beat, the old Lombardo, you know, to get to get to get to, I'm yeah. fine with. And I played that differently to Nick and I always thought that I played it better than Nick. I'm not saying I'm better than Nick in any other way, but you know, that, 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 that. He was always a bit too quick on the triplet with the feet, in my opinion. Mm. But yeah, it's weird because, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it, good. I mean, I, 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 I like the fact that that was something, it was fresh for them. It was something new for them. Um, and obviously they went on with Adrian and Adrian's, I love Adrian. Adrian's fantastic. Yeah. Sorry. Adrian, Adrian no, that's all good, man. You talk any time. There's no worries whatsoever. Yes. We have, I like to say these aren't interviews, mate. These are conversations. That's important. Mm. To, a very important yeah. distinction. I've had to explain to a few listeners, especially to this Cradle of Filth Chronicles, as I call them, um, that they're not interviews, they're conversations. We go wherever the conversation takes us. Okay. So wherever, yeah, awesome. you, wherever you want to take it, go for it. There's, it's a, you know, the Atlas is our playground, so to speak, in that, re in that respect. Right. Awesome. Um, I feel like as though your exit was a sliding doors moment for the group. 
okay, because you were there at a time when the group splintered or you, certainly your tenure was, whether you, you're in the studio at the time when it happened Both or times. not. <laughs> Both times. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's, I mean, well, the, the from the cradle to enslave, well, the, the, the splintering of the group that happened in from the cradle to enslave for an old fan like me was cataclysmic. Okay, because mm. they went in a very different direction on MIDI, and I hear it. I know a lot of the, as I say, I know a lot of the people that have gotten to the band since uh, mm. year two thousand. They think MIDI is up here, but I mean, for me, I remember first hearing it and thinking, "What the hell's going on here? You got yeah. the majesty, you got the majesty of Cradle, then you've got this sub grinding shit on on MIDI." And I've since come to appreciate it because I, I couldn't, will never ever devalue Paul's contribution because he bloody carried that band for well over a oh, decade. Yeah. And and that's really interesting. Sorry to interrupt because mm. when we uh, when I left for the first time and they went on to do principal, and then the, uh, Paul Ben and Paul we all uh, did the Blood Divine. They were so um, they weren't bitter, but there was very much it was quite an acrimonious split. Mm. And Paul Allender was one of the most vocal about how how he's, you know, had it with them. And I can't remember the details of what was said, but, you know, they were through. And then uh, when we, when the Blood Divine, well, Paul left the Blood Divine and then we disbanded shortly after that. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, Paul's back in Cradle and all of those things that he said and all of, you know, that was kind of by the by. And mm -hmm. interestingly, you mentioned Midian. On the Midian tour, I played with a band called Christian Death supporting awesome. supporting cradle so i was back with with paul and dan um and obviously the midian lineup and i remember you know we just spent like three years in a band together <clears throat> and i remember so, i didn't really talk to paul much he was just like yeah it's really good to be playing the old stuff again i'm like okay cool well you know you were fucking you fucking hated it when you <laughs> when we we're in the blood <laughs> divine uh, but I'm not I'm not slagging him off at all because you know you, you in those days it was a case of you know he just wanted to play and he's a phenomenal guitar player absolutely phenomenal guitar player and I I think that's a, the the crux of it is he's got such a talent and it's just you know you just need to to try and channel that in the best way that he could and he did because he did well he did a fair few records with Cradle after that so but yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. What you? I, I got you mid mid question again. Sorry, mate. <laughs> no dramas. Honestly, there's no no worries whatsoever. It's just a thrill to, to catch up and to gain your insight into these things. I mean, there's some great detail there you've just provided. But I mean, when, when I talk about cataclysmic, the issue here is that of dark blood and fucking the, the tune written by Stuart. That he's told me that was that was the direction that that was the song that was meant to be on the next Cradle of Filth album, which was going to be a Clive Barker concept album. Okay, so yeah. it was going to be a completely different beast, potentially with you on drums moving forward. It would have been the you know that old old nineties crew. It might have had a bit you know a couple of albums yeah. in it after that, but of course it went in a very different direction. So that was the one song on the EP that you didn't play on. Adrian was drafted into play. So can you recall the story around why you weren't on that track? Um. Yeah. I went in, we did the title track, we did the two covers. Um, at the time of recording, it was just going to be that. It was just going to be those three songs. Um, and then when it came out, they'd added a demo version of one song. I can't remember which song it was. I want to say, I can't remember, which, a demo version uh, of Dark Blood and Fucking and another song. So it was more of an EP. But at the time we recorded that, um, I I don't think there was any talk of it being more than those three songs, okay. um, and certainly with the with the with the um, the songs that were added, um, I was not aware of those songs at all. Yeah, it's you know? a weird it's a weird EP in that it has some some of the band's greatest material on it, given of Dark Blood and Fucking and From the Cradle to Enslaver on there, and also the cover, the Anathema cover. I've spoken to one of the Kavanaugh brothers about that tune, um, but. It, yeah, it was a situation. Then and then, right at the end, you've got a, a funeral in Carpathia, like a demo version or something. Yeah. Nick is Nick was not happy that that was on there at all. I remember, or Nick or well, Stuart, one of the two. Yeah. Well, see, this is the uh, the, the other thing was I remember, I remember hearing the original version of Dusk, not the version that 
everyone knows and loves now. But I remember hearing Dusk and Her Embrace with the principal lineup, the, yeah. the version that was not, that didn't see the light of day. Mm. And it just fuck, it blew my fucking mind because uh, it was the most technical, most intricate music. Um, and obviously the whole thing with Cacophonous imploded. Uh, but I remember um, Queen of Winter Throne that's on Vampire, the version that was on that, tape because i only it was only on the uh, a b-side of um a 90 minute tape that paul ryan had mm. i was like man this is fucking incredible um and you know that music was just literally the most i could if that had come out at the time as was planned it would have been a totally different i mean hey they're, they're not exactly unsuccessful um mm. but yeah that, i think that would have really um blew 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 things completely out of the water you know yeah well the but they the from the cradle to enslave ep it just seemed to be even the video pandemonium yeah it, it just it just to me looking back it was a missed opportunity because it could have launched the band in as i say in an entirely different direction the the video the reason i say the video is a missed opportunity is because half of it's that bloody behind the scenes stuff and the behind the scenes stuff is is not that interesting let's face it <laughs> and i mean it's the video itself is it's it's okay you know it's a bit of horror noir with a bit of porno shit thrown yeah. in, you know yeah. but it's it doesn't stand the test of time to be honest with you when you look back on it that look back i on wasn't it involved in, i wasn't involved in the video um I, 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 do you know what? Looking back on it, I think it was a classic case of they signed to Music for Nations. I think they put out. I mean, what was the first MFN release? I think it was Dusk, wasn't it? I, I don't uh, know. You yeah, know, better. definitely. Yeah, the the yeah um, the second I, I, version I, with Stuart on it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was a case of look, we need we need something to to for the stop gap. So do an EP, and then we'll do the next record. I think it was a bit of you know they had to put something out um, to keep the. Uh, keep the wheels churning as it were you know mm -hmm. yeah what did you tell my me what did you tell <laughs> me you told me someone opened their fucking trap <laughs> and he someone must have said something to the record company the record company said that's a great idea now he didn't say whether yeah. it was danny or not but i couldn't imagine it would be anybody else well who knows and like, like i say i mean i was like stuart stuart was always a bit he was always a moody moody guy but in a nice way um, and it was imperative that him and Dan sometimes didn't see eye to eye. And when I came in, I mean, mm -hmm. thinking about that, the Cradle to Enslave, we had me, Rob, I've known Rob, well, I haven't spoken to Rob for about 20 years, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, I knew, I kind of grew up with Rob. Um, and obviously we had John or Jan yes, on the John, other guy, yep. who's an absolute, what a great guy, but a lunatic. And we had Stuart. Um, and you know, when they, when him and Dan weren't, that they, they weren't seeing eye to eye for that whole time. And it was a bit, it was a bit weird looking back on it. Oh, and we had Les as well. I love Les. Les, what a fucking great bloke Les is. Again, haven't seen him for a while and I only really saw him in, when I did that, you know, I only really got to know him then. Well, I think, I think Stu, Nick and Les for an old fan like me, they're more or less the soul of the band, but because, because of the way that, Dusk sounded on tour because I saw them in 1997 when they came out, and and of course Cruelty, and then From the Cradle to Enslave. But look, you, you mentioned you mentioned Robin in there, okay? So you haven't spoken to him in, in decades. But um, tell tell me about your your relationship with Robin. How did you first meet Robin? And and obviously he was the the he was part of the reason I think why you were able to come into Cradle. Yeah, I would I would um, I would say that. I mean, I. I mean, we, <laughs> yes and no, in the sense that the first person I met from that whole circle was, I was at college with Paul Ryan and I had my death metal band. He had his death metal band, Cradle of Filth. I thought he was a poser, pretender, lovely guy, <laughs> but I'm like, no one knows more about death metal than me. Come on, are you serious? We're in Ipswich. And I, he lent me the demo. It was fucking brilliant. And it went from there. Um, and, and, I, and I knew, I saw him and Dan, like local hardcore gigs here so i knew of them um so we go back a long way i've known those guys since i was 15 um and rob used to play in a thrash band here uh ipswich uh, called malicious intent and i was in another thrash band called cardinal sin so we were like in two rival kind of thrash bands and it's just we, you know in the scene in ipswich in that time was just fucking it was really good really good there was always there was always a band to go and see every 
not maybe not every night, but certainly every weekend. So we kind of grew up going through the ranks. And then um, I can't remember how he got the the gig in Cradle now. I, I honestly don't know. Because John was playing, a guy called John Pritchard was the original bass player. Mm-hmm. Nice guy. Um, I think that I said, I know a guy who plays bass, get Robin to play bass. I think, because I can't think how else it would have worked mm. in the sense that he didn't know the Ryan brothers. Well, at the time, Ben wasn't in the band and he didn't know that side of, you know, the Hadley crew. Yep. So, but I don't want to go on record saying that because that might be completely, that's just how my brain's working at the moment. So, yeah, we, we, we just played in loads of bands together. And then, of course, the December Moon thing came about which was essentially, you know, him, him writing all the music and then we rehearsed and did the album. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I a lot of respect, a lot of respect for Robin, very talented guy. I, again, he's another one that if that talent had been nurtured properly and effectively, I think, you know, he would have been, I don't know what he's doing now, but you know, it would have been a different story. It's a shame, yeah, really. He's for, for such a huge presence. He's kind of a shadowy figure in the band's history, isn't he? Because um, I remember Nick, Nick told me that he felt that he didn't know how to tie up his shoelaces and stuff. So there's obviously, like, there's conflict in any band. God knows I've been in enough of them, my bloody self, to know that, that they, they can be <laughs> very, very difficult and interesting places to be in at the best of times. And you're just trying to get to the either the end of a rehearsal or even worse, at the end of your bloody gig, just make it through intact without yeah. murdering one another at the end of it because of the mistakes that are made and even just people's attitude on stage or what have you. So there's never going to be, there should never be any judgment on that front, especially if people no. are referring to comments, um, drawing on their memory and making comments on their memory, you know, but we, with your, for such an enormously talented group that was producing, you mentioned Paul Ryan there, gosh knows I've tried to contact him a few times after having a chat with Ben, but it seems I can like, hook you up. oh, brother, that would be magnificent if you could. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Uh, Cause after the falling out again, they, they, him and Dan and the old label manager of Cacophonous, the guy called Neil, don't remember his surname, they re-released the, um, what did they re-release? Something recently? Uh, yeah, the, not- the, the, the Dusk and Her Embrace, the original Sin version. Yeah. yeah. So th- that on paper, years ago, that was never going to happen, you know, because they were yeah. all like, oh, fucking Neil ripped us off or whatever. Uh, and to have those three, you know, and to, I remember seeing the photo of, Paul and Dan in the same room. I would never have put that, never have put that um, together. There was, especially between uh, uh, Paul and Nick as well. They had a, there's a lot of shit there. And, and again, I, I knew this would happen. So if I go into one about that, I'll, I'll tell you what not to put in. But yeah, fucking yeah. hell. Yeah. <sighs> but but it, 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 dysfunction seems to be the law, but talent seems to be the rule. Okay. So, all, all of, like Robin's contribution, the December Moon uh, album's great, fantastic stuff, and it's like, and then it just poof, disappeared, and then he went back into Cradle, obviously. So yeah. with, with the December Moon thing, was there ever an opportunity to sort of follow up on that, or was it ever, was it again, was it just going to be like a one-time deal, just something you did? Um, it was difficult because Rob was in Cradle at the time, and I was in The Blood Divine at the time, and... To the end, towards the end of it, extreme noise terror as well. So mm. you had it wasn't just a question of me and Rob getting together and making an album. It was a question of well, Rob's signed to Music for Nations. I was signed to Peaceville Stroke, then which morphed into Music for Nations, and it was very difficult to find middle ground. Um, so it was just for that one album. Um, we did w- always want to do a second album. Uh, and it never transpired, uh, and then we we lost contact, and he he moved away from Ipswich. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so it was difficult. It was tricky at the time because <clears throat> on the <coughs> excuse me on Damage Three Eight One, it says that I appear courtesy of Music for Nations, which they had to MFN insisted on that. Um, and it was funny because I remember being at MFN, and Andy Black, the guy that worked there, was like, "Well." Oh, we heard that December. Wait, that blood, what a bloody brilliant album. We'd be interested in that. 
we'd be interested if you guys want to do another album. And that was that was like, well, yeah, that'd be great because we're we're on MFN in different bands anyway. Mm. But again, it never materialized. And it <laughs> that was right around the time of Rob was doing uh, cruelty. Um and yeah, it just just never never materialized. Um, yeah, which well, is life a, has other plans, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. What what's um what's your take on Danny's role in the studio when you were there recording? Because from what I understand, I mean, Stuart was really at the helm of the band at that time. Certainly around the music, Danny. Danny, this has been said repeatedly across the interviews. Danny doesn't write music; he comes in after that's done. So, from yeah. from your perspective, that. The music was being written. Did Danny come over and say anything to you about your performance? No. He would, well, in the rehearsal studio, it was just a question of, and again, I'm trying to go back in time and, and remember, we were just left to, to get on with it. And um, you're right, Stuart was, you know, the guy that would be like, no, do that there and then do that there. And then we'll do this, and and Dan would just kind of kind of hover. Um, he'd he'd contribute if he felt he needed to, um, but in the studio, it was it was kind of left to us work workmen, you know. Mm, yeah. Um, but he never he was never like you know lording it up like a like some kind of maestro. He was always he was always just Dan, and that's the thing. That's the the difficulty that I. Um, it's different for me because, I, like I said, we were fifteen-year-old kids going to obituary and autopsy and all these great. You know, we were kids in in the scene, and mm. we kind of. So he wouldn't ever come to me and be like, "Oh, I think maybe if I'd have stayed in the band and had a longer time with him, he probably would have done over time." But there was never that like, right? Not being funny, da 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 da. It was. It was. All, we, we all still had the same relationship, and even to this day, when I see him around, you know, it's just. It's just. Just you know, people that are two guys that have known each other for a long time. Yeah, gotcha. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was never tyrannical or um, or anything like that. The only time I remember him being a bit like that was when we were playing pubs. Literally, the the first, I remember uh, it's a fucking Audi. Do you have Audi in Australia? Yep. Yeah, they're everywhere. Well, yeah, there's a lovely pub just 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 down in Witten. It's called Safe Harbor, and we Cradle played there a couple of times. And I remember we were played with this band called Shocker, and they, they were shocking, <laughs> like proper like proper heavy metal, you know. And that was the, with the hair and everything. And there was an argument of, as to who was going to go on last, who was going to headline. And I remember Dan saying, "Well, we're fucking we're fucking signed. We should go on." We should go on last. This is a joke. And I remember him standing on a can as he did it and he fell flat on his ass. <laughs> That's the only time, the only time that I remember him ever having that kind of like, well, you know, that kind of ego thing. Yeah. Obviously, when he's had a few drinks, he could be a knob. And that's why he gets, you know, it's the reputation of, oh, I met Dan in a club. He's a fucking dip. But, you know, we're all the same, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You know, in the sense that in it, putting myself in his position, I'm not surprised because you get all these knobs coming up to you sometimes, especially in Ipswich back in the day. He used to get all sorts of people coming up to him and they all want to chat to him. And that was before the whole camera phone thing. And, you know, but yeah. yeah. So no, I can't say anything bad about Dan because he hasn't ever done anything that I've thought, oh, my God, what a dick, you know. And if he did, I would be able to actually, you know what, there is, there is a fucking story. And that was on the Midian tour with Christian death where they, he was on our bus and he was larruped. He was fucked. And he, um, he spilt wine in, I can't remember whose bunk it was, Oof. Yeah. but he was, you know, I was like, Dan, man, Dan, you just spilt fucking wine in so-and-so's bunk. And he was really apologetic. And, you know, the next day he came and sorted it all out and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. And I, I think that if, had that have been, you know, someone from, I don't know, the crew or someone that was part of his entourage, I don't think it would have been dealt with with the respect that he did mm -hmm. with in that situation. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm digressing. I'm sorry. No, it's all important stuff, mate. It's all part of your, part of the fabric of the band's 
history, if you like. But uh, it is interesting, though, isn't it? He's the one tenured member over the past. It's it's getting into 30, 32 years, I think, now, isn't it? 1990, 1991. So, <laughs> you know, so 32 years, he's the one consistent individual across that. There's been something in the vicinity. If Gosh, if you include touring members, not including touring members, it's over 40 tenured members, so people that have appeared in liner notes on the back of albums if you buy the physical product or what have you, or if you go to Wikipedia. Some of them didn't even exist. Ja- Jared Demeter never existed. Yeah. You didn't know that. <laughs> I knew that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? I mean, they got a photo of Robert and made it those longer. Uh, but the thing is, was. Andrew, the thing is, <laughs> it's the thing is that, you, you know, for, for Cradle to work, and indeed for a lot of metal bands to work, they need that figurehead. So you take the figurehead away. You take the you take Dan out of the equation. What have you got? You know, you've got you've not got. You need Dan to be the spokesperson and the voice, and indeed, you know, creatively, he's second to none lyrically. Absolutely brilliant, and and I think that's that's the crux of it, in the sense that you can. He's always been very, very protected by, you know, com- record labels because they know that Dan, it could be Danny in the fills, right? Mm. Because it doesn't really matter who's playing drums. It doesn't really matter who's playing bass. Um, as long as you've got that figurehead. And I think that's partly why he's lasted so long. Not because, and I'm not disrespecting his his passion and his commitment and you know his drive because that is obviously um, there for all to see. But I think just just the way that the the um, the thing the whole thing set up, you know, that he has to, you know, without him, there's no band. Simple as that. From from what I gather, Faye's influence over the band after Cruelty it just it became huge. Okay, and. And I'm joined. This is me speculating and joining pieces of jigsaw puzzle. You know the conversational jigsaw yeah. puzzle pieces together. They the opportunity. Marilyn Manson was huge at the time. We all remember 1998, 1999. Mechanical Animals, very different album to Antichrist Superstar, mm-hmm. but it was very much. You saw both album covers, the Antichrist and the Mechanical Animals thing. Both had Marilyn on front. It was after that explosion if you like and and the success of cruelty you started seeing merch just with danny on the front danny's head that that wasn't around before and i remember because i've been into the group since 1996 so i remember and i had the merch mm. through the um i can't remember the the merchandising company that they set up but i had all of the really ornate um merchandise I wish i yeah. still had it but yeah. but you know it, it seemed like yeah. there was a real drive and i understand that it comes from Faye to put danny smack bang in the middle and and part of the reason behind that was to sort of capitalize on the success of the the marilyn manson thing is that do you think i'm on track with that with those thoughts um i, th- I think that's a fair i think that's their fair comments um in terms of a business, from a business point of view, it makes sense. Um, and particularly because there were so many lineup changes, if I was doing Faye's job, that's probably exactly what I would do. Because then you protect your product. Because if you've only got to look after one guy, make sure he's happy to run everything, mm. then it doesn't matter if you've got a revolving door. Um, so I would say, I would say, you're pretty, you know, I would agree with you. I think you're pretty, from my point of view, I think you're pretty much spot on. I've only ever spoken to Faye once on the phone. And that was that phone call where she was like, look, just learn the set because things it's gonna go, it's gonna go, it's gonna go off with Nick. Yeah. That's the only time I've the only dealing I've ever had with Faye. So yeah. I can't really comment more than that, but I would say that you're pretty that's a pretty um informed view I, th- I think i think that's certainly what it looks like well again i'm trying to have a conversation with her i've reached out to her on linkedin but look you know how it is and especially recently with kit passing away there's no way i'd ever impose but you know if she ever <laughs> listens to this uh god bless her and and also kit but I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with her about these things because she would yeah. know she was there yeah yeah absolutely um and i think Enough. Uh, well, I would gesture to say that enough water under the bridge has passed for her to give a you know kind of a no holds barred interview, and that's that's not you fishing for 
you know, gossip or tabloid journalism. It's just about filling in the gaps for, for the people that are genuinely interested in what happened, you know, around those yeah, times. It. And it's, yeah. it is, it is, it is interesting, you know, I, I get why it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that would be, um, because no one really thinks about managers, do they? No one really sort of thinks, and she's probably got the best stories. She, you know, she's probably got better stories than all of us. Yeah, oh, I reckon she'd be a wealth of uh, a heap of those sort of things, you know. And, and as I say, made it. She's on the bucket list, believe me. As is um, Mike Exeter and John Fryer as well. Both of them as well. But there, there is one more member of the band I wanted to ask you your opinion on about, and that's Sarah. Now, just before I get you to answer that, I have had email interactions with her she will not talk about cradle she is black and white told me that she's it's done it's over she wasn't rude to me or anything like that but she left me with uh no alternative view than to say that pursuing her for conversation about this was was not going to happen unless she turned as a does a complete 180 so that said yes what's your perspective on sarah uh i think sarah is fucking awesome I think she's brilliant. Um, so, again, I've only ever dealt with her when I, I knew her when she was in the band and I wasn't. Um, and again, like on the, on the Midian tour, she was doing the uh, backups. Um, I've always liked Sarah. I always got on. She's a, she's, um, she's a proper Essex girl, you know. <laughs> she's, she's funny. Um, and she was doing a um, – last time I spoke to her was in my house and she was doing a solo album. She wanted me to come and play drums. And, I, again, that was – I was out of I, – I wasn't, you know, playing at that time. Um, so, yeah, that was the last time I spoke to her on the phone. She was talking about doing a Madonna cover, which I thought was quite novel. Mm. She's very talented. Um and I, I, I don't know what went on between her and and the, the cradle machine, um, but yeah, it's she kind of fell by the wayside. But as a person, she's awesome. She's brilliant. Yeah, look, I've got my own theories there, and look, she's mentioned it, but she's alluded to there being issues from management with her weight. And if 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 it is the case, how fucking ridiculous in metal, the one genre where you get free to be you. I mean, for God's sake. Oh, yeah. and, and the floating if, head thing in the Midian video, it was, it was ludicrous. She was just marginalised, wasn't yeah. she? Uh, well, I don't know it, like, I don't know anything about that, but um, it wouldn't surprise me. But the thing is, the way she was the way she handles herself on stage and, and the clothes that she wears uh, are um, fantastic. And you don't think, oh my God, you know, look, it's not the weight thing doesn't even come into it. She's, you know, she's beautiful for how she was um, and how she presented and how she sang. That's the most important thing. But the, the image thing was, I think, at that time, really on point in terms of how the, how the band members looked. Okay, maybe, maybe not Martin and his, and maybe not, actually, maybe not uh, Adrian either with that, all the PVC stuff. Oh, but God, yeah. in terms of her, her image with the band, I think it's always been pretty good. And if that, if the weight thing was uh, an issue for management, then you're right. It's absolutely pathetic. Rather than saying, right, okay, how do we make the band look great for this next video or this next show, whatever it is, to go down that route is, is ridiculous. Um, but then having said that, I, 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 you know, she's such a, She's, she's such a cool woman. I don't know why that um, she wouldn't just be like, yeah, I'll give you an interview. But, hey, there's probably a lot of stuff that we don't know, so. Yeah, yeah. Look, she she look, she look, shared things, you know, from the perspective that um, she really isn't happy with some of the members of the group and she didn't want to yeah. go. And, like, she, she would go to the point where she would think she wanted to share stuff, but then she went, oh, I've gone too far, and then she'd pull back. And I'm, I'm like, well, there's always going to be respect here in, in, in so far as share whatever you want, however you want, okay, uh, yeah. which is why I didn't air uh, Paul's comments when he asked me not to. I've never been about that bullshit tabloid side of things. No. I'm just an old fan having conversations with members of a killer band. And, look, yeah, I mean, yeah. But I, I just from even back then you'd hear this beautiful voice on an album, on the album, with crucial, you know, her and uh, was it uh, – the the young lady who the lady who was recently murdered by a bloody terrorist. Sorry, I can't remember her name now. Is it Martina? 
the other singer that they had that was uh, on the early stuff. Everybody's probably yelling at me saying, you spoke about it with Ben. Yes, I did. I can't remember a name now. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how. I know, I know that in the early days they would have Sarah singing, but the voice, the spoken word um, parts, female parts, were done by another woman because bless Sarah's Essex drawl, you know, just wouldn't work. <laughs> um, but I remember, there being, I remember there being another, I want to say Danielle. Andrea. I don't know why. Andrea Meyer. So I was on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, Andrea yeah, Meyer. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, I know, I know that that was a thing in the early days, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, but Sarah was a crucial part of the band's sound, but she was never in the photos. So and and she and yeah. I, I did go to one meet and greet, one that they did in on the back of Midi. And so what's that? Two thousand and one, I think they were in Australia touring in that one there. And Sarah mm-hmm. wasn't there then, and I remember thinking it was a little bit odd because she was certainly on stage. Um, so I was like, she was a non-member of the band, but still participating in everything yeah. that a member would. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's strange. Now you mention it, it is it is strange. The only thing that I would put. Down to that is that she wasn't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but she wasn't on every song. So a set, um, certainly in the earlier days, would only feature her like popping up here and there. Um, so I don't know. I don't know why that wasn't, a, I don't know why that was a, um, maybe it was a management decision. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Don't know. one. Unless, unless it comes from, one thing I will say, unless it comes from either Faye or Sarah, we'll never know 100% for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, hey, I mentioned uh, Mike Exeter. So he was brought back in um, after the relative failure of the production on uh, Cruelty, something which I didn't hear at the time, I must confess. I thought the album, courtesy of the songs, just sounded brilliant. But he, you worked with Mike, you must have, because he was behind the desk, I think, when you were recording. So what was it like working with a, with a fellow like Mike? I can remember Mike Exeter and there was another guy there, um, you probably know his name. Literally, Andrew, it's literally, we drove to, Rob and I drove up to Liverpool. We got the stuff together. I set up and I think everything was everything was either done in a day or two days. Uh, I remember them being very nice guys. I remember them being very professional. Um, and the other guys had worked with them before, so it was a bit of a rapport there that, that they had that I didn't. Um, but that's about all I can say. To be honest, it's about all I can say. Dan Spring. They were very good. Yeah, the other fella. Yeah. Or what, one day, two days. So Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I think he was crucial to the band's sound overall because you can hear what later albums sound like. And and I think John Fryer has been unfairly oh well, you know, when you really deep dive into it, but but John Fry is a, is a legend. I mean, God Almighty, who hasn't he worked with? It's probably easy to put so, but just for people who yeah. don't know who he is, you know, he's done many albums with Depeche Mode. Uh, I'm not saying he's responsible for that sound, but he was around through them crafting an yeah. incredible career. Nine Inch Nails, yeah. he had Pretty Hate Machine. Okay, that revolutionised God. Everything was different after right. Pretty Hate Machine, wasn't it? But um, yeah. did you have anything to do with John at all? Or was, it, or was that? No. Nothing to do with him at all. Jesus, it sounded, Sorry. it sounded magnificent, though, didn't it, from the cradle to the song, though. To when you heard it, were you just like, oh, my God, looks, listen to that. Yeah, I, and you know what it was? It was it was Stuart. It was Stuart's riff. You know that 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 main riff with the the little guitar melody. I knew that it was a it was a massive riff. And Stuart, I mean, again, in terms of what he did on Cruelty, the riffs, the fucking riffs. Now, this is the other thing, Andrew. That you need to. When I was in <clears throat> Cradle first time round, I was proper death metal all the way. So when this black metal stuff started coming around, okay, we put the face paint on the stuff, but I was very much in the camp of this, this new stuff, you know, Emperor, Burzum, Dark Throne. It wasn't what I considered black metal. Uh, black metal to me was Venom, you know, Early Frost, Merciful Fate, Bathory, Hellhammer. And I didn't really like or get into this trend uh, of, you know, this second wave of black metal. And I really couldn't connect with it. Um, certainly not in the same way that everyone else did. 
uh, other guys in the band did. Obviously, they were they were right to embrace that wave, but. You know, sorry, what was it? What was the question? Sorry, I'm rambling again. Oh, no. I got there from... So- oh, we're just talking about how, how I, I just love the sound. You know, we're talking about John Fryer and you've, you've yeah. answered the question by talking about the riff, which is killer, because I agree with you. You know, yeah. I mean, without a killer riff, listen to those old Bathory albums, like the first Bathory album and, you know, this, yeah. the, you know, In League With Satan, these sort of albums. I mean, you listen to them, they sound, to be honest, they sound like shit, but they, they, they don't because of the riffs. That are on there, and people yeah, forget yeah. that metal is about the riff. Yeah, exactly, and and that was that that was the real focal part of that song. I knew that it was, um, I knew that it was, I knew that whatever they did had to be significant at that time. Mm. So it was, I knew what I was doing was going to be um, like lauded, you know. Um, so yeah, it was the riff that did it. Uh, the, I knew that the, the riff made the song. So you mentioned you had some positive things to say about John, and I've got to say, given my conversations, many conversations with the older members, that's rare. Um, <laughs> your, your take on John is that he's, he's a hilarious fella, but did you see him contribute much Love. in the studio? Um, I think as much as anyone else. I don't. Uh, obviously, the um, we we did one song uh, and two covers, so he would always be larking around, always be, you know, the the the, the funny guy for want of a better better description. Mm. But did he contribute much? I th- I think he did. Yeah, I, I think it would be unfair to say that he didn't contribute. I certainly remember him throwing suggestions in and you know the good thing about john is that when you're when we were rehearsing that song we'd have to obviously we played it over and over again to try and iron things out before going to the studio and john would always be you know pop up giving it metal face and you know trying to you know get into it uh whereas Stuart would just be there with his fag hanging out of his mouth just just doing his just playing what was required because he obviously thought well i just want to go home or whatever mm. But yeah, no, I think I think I think um, John contributed as much as as anyone else. I don't I, whether he wrote as much pound for pound. Um, I I wouldn't like to comment, but certainly when on the Midian tour, he was yeah, he just did his thing, did his thing, and uh, he did it well. He was you know, I like I think John's awesome. I wonder where he is now. I thought I think he moved to Canada or something. I don't know. I haven't seen him in years. Yeah, that's what lovely. I heard. Yeah, that's what I heard. He seems to have dropped off the radar completely and believe yeah, me. Yeah, I think that's what we do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, look, I've tried to um, see if he's on LinkedIn or something, but, I mean, you know, given the fact that he goes by, well, he's known as John, but his name is Gian and this sort of thing, God knows where he's ended up and what he's doing. But it seems to me like yeah. as though he's just left the music industry completely and he must be leading a, an everyday yeah. life like we are, you know? Yeah. No, he was big into um, like computing and IT and stuff, and I did hear a rumor that he was working in that realm, uh, possibly something to do with computer games. I don't know, but hey, fair play to him. Look, nice guy. He was always really cool to me. He was always really cool to everyone. Mm. Um, and I think he he did a tour with Christian Death after he left. Yes, um, like a, a, a run around Europe. So yeah, yeah lovely bloke. Yeah, there you go. Hey, look, I'll finish by by talking about Extreme Noise Terror. I mentioned up top I'm fascinated with your tenure in the group because it was this, for people who don't know, uh, Extreme Noise Terror, you know, this is a group that collaborated with KLF during the British Music Awards and stuff. They had an enormous impact there for, for a very short period of time on the on the psyche, certainly the, the, the British psyche. Um, mm. in a very subversive outfit. I love the group, I've got to say, and I've had a chat to Barney about the album Damage 381, which coincidentally you're on as well. So Barney is the singer. Everybody knows him as a singer for Napalm Death, but he wasn't for a period of time. He was actually the singer for Extreme Noise Terror, and Phil Vane jumped in. Yeah, Phil Vane jumped into Napalm Death. And I remember when it happened, thinking after Diatribes, I thought they'd – and again, sorry, just to repeat myself – I'd spoken to Barney about it because I wanted to know if the reaction to diatribes was so bad because I remember the reaction to diatribes from Napalm Death had forced him out. And he he more or less said, look, I wanted to keep on going the grind route, but the other guys wanted to do this Sonic Youth sort of influenced yeah. music. 
and um, and it and it may have put. He didn't say whether it was or it wasn't, but I think the the inference was clear that yeah, they they weren't really getting along and seeing eye to eye musically at the very least. He went into extreme noise terror, terror, Phil Vane into um, Napalm Death. Nothing happened with Napalm Death, but Extreme Noise Terror came out with this killer album that you're on, Damage Three Eighty One. So, what's your take on that episode of, of your musical wow. career? Right. So. I grew up going to ENT shows here in Ipswich as a young kid. Literally, I was at high school. We'd go to, you know, um, incredible bills back then, you know, Extreme Noise, Terror, Bolt Thrower, Carcass, Napalm. Uh, so I literally grew up seeing, uh, you know, that was when they were proper, proper hardcore, UK hardcore punk. Mm. Um, so I, I can't remember how I... They rehearse, ENT used to rehearse at the same place that Cradle rehearsed, um, a studio called Springvale Studios on the outskirts of Ipswich. And it was, I think it was Rob again. Rob's like, oh, you know, uh, ENT are looking for a, for a drummer. I'm like, cool. So I went in and I auditioned to, because obviously, oh, of course I'm going to, of course I'm going to audition. It's fucking extreme noise here. Of course <laughs> I am. So the first thing, first thing that I do when I, I go in, I set my drums up. Did I use my kit? Yeah, I think I did, yeah. Um, and the first thing that I see is a McDonald's carton on the floor. But it wasn't just discarded. It was there, right? And I'm like, um, what's, what's that about? You know, knowing their, their, their history and their politics. Mm. I was vegetarian for 19 years because I grew up with the hardcore scene. So mm-hmm. to go into an extreme noise terror audition and find a fucking McDonald's cart in there. I was, I wanted to, I had some questions. So I'm like, uh, what's, what's that about? And Dean, in his inimitable way, was like, oh, we don't give a fuck about any of that now. I'm like, okay, cool. I don't really care either. So <laughs> anyway, I, 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 I got the gig um, and they were, I look back on the album with, with fond memories because they're just, the, it was, it was just ridiculous. But, as a as a as a drummer, I was doing an album on Earache Records, which I grew up. Some of my favorite albums are the classic Earache albums from you know the late eighties, early nineties. I literally, mm. yeah, abs- absolutely. I was a madness, realms of Ca- realm of chaos, symphonies of sickness, you know, mentally murdered, all the napalm stuff. I could go on for ages. That's mm. literally my childhood. That is what I was. <clears throat> that that's my terrorizer. That's my stuff. Um, so to do an album on Earache with a band that I grew up uh, loving was a no-brainer. But the problem with that was um, was that as it was Dean and Ali who were the main, they were the band there. And there was a guy called Lee Barrett on bass. Mm-hmm. So Lee Barrett on bass, you say Lee Barrett to someone, people are like, who? But Lee Barrett actually started Candlelight Records signed emperor discovered emperor um and toured with mm. you know took was was the man who put together the cradle and emperor fear of black metal planet tour in this country mm-hmm. so he's you know that guy is responsible for for giving emperor to the world so he was on base and the music that ENT were writing at that time was it was just stuff that i was to me it was really out of date it's fantastic that a, a bunch of crusties like ent were embracing it but they really should have done it when napalm did it mm. 10 years before you know that i remember some of the riffs that they were writing and it was very it was <laughs> it was difficult for me to swallow because these were these were recycled carcass riffs that really didn't have much impact in my opinion and I think that they would have, it would have served them better to have taken their original ethos and just given it a bit more of a modern sort of sound. Mm. So if you can imagine some of their early recordings, but with a, with a more modern, polished production like Demonstrate at One's Got. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was, it, re- it was weird for me. And of course, at that time, I was doing the Blood Divine thing, which was taking off slightly more. So I kind of had to... Uh, say, look, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm, you know, and it was, a, it was never really, a, you know, they were so all over the place in terms of, well, everything, um, that it was never really anything more than that. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. What was it like working with Barney? 
Well, funny thing is, I, I when we recorded Demonstrate One, I, I didn't I didn't work with, work with Barney. The only time I did anything with Barney was um, when he came down to do the photos, the press photos. Oh, really? And he's a lovely bloke. He's a yeah. That's the only time. Yeah. Uh, and and the whole Phil thing was really weird because. I remember Phil being around a little bit at the start of my, and then all of a sudden he was like, well, I got the napalm gun. I was like, well, cool, man. Nice. one." But I never really knew how that was going to work. Um, and I don't think, I don't think it worked out particularly well. And then Phil came back to the, God rest his soul. I love that guy. He was, he was a really, you know, such a, such a nice bloke and such a, you know, I don't know. It's, he was massive in the, in the in the local scene you know and i think that it was never really destined to work out for, with him and napalm or with barney and ent it's it, the best way i can put it is like that i mean both bands literally swapped for a matter of months and then swapped back mm. you know it was weird uh and hey i'll tell you what even though I'm not a massive fan of the late and napalm stuff, I saw them. I mean, it's years ago now because of COVID and everything. But we saw them with obituary, and I've seen them a couple of times. And fucking Barney's is awesome on stage. He's really good. He's really found his own niche, mm. you know. Uh, and when he joined the band after Lee Dorian and Bill left, as a fan at the time, I was like, "Well, what the fuck is this?" Um, but he's really carved out his own niche and napalm are a real force in themselves you know they've always been a force but you know how many corruption and it just i don't know it just didn't really work at the time but they've they've plowed through it and yeah, fair yeah. Play to them. yeah again i was around back then and i remember the uh I thought the album was great, but the band members didn't really like it. And Barney actually told me that he, he wouldn't change anything. But, yeah, it wasn't something to ho- hoist up on a flag there. But the other thing about Barney is he was in Benediction as well. So Yeah, I fucking love that. I love Subconscious Terror. That's yeah. probably my favourite my favorite Barney output. You know, it's a horrible production. Mick Harris produced it. And it's, a, it's you know, it's a shitty cover. And a, uh, but, yeah, you know, that to me, that's, that's my childhood. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I remember, you know. Brilliant. You, Brilliant. Got, you got to have albums that but, sound like that from back then, though. That that was the era. Yeah, you did. Mm. And, and and I think I think the whole the, the the reason it was a the whole Napalm thing was difficult for me because when I first heard Napalm Death and the Peel session, uh, and then Scum, and that classic lineup, um, for them to all of a sudden change overnight and start wearing you know Death shirts and uh, uh, joggers, yeah, and to go to Mara Sound yeah. and have that real polished, horrible production, but a real polished sound. It's a complete antithesis of what they were, and it was difficult for me to swallow at the time. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, they're not a Mara Sound band to, at all, but, yeah, they did yeah, it once. Not. But Mass Appeal Madness followed Harmony Corruption, and that's killer. Yeah. That was, that was, that was Barney finding his feet, Mick Harris, you know, raw production, a bit more of the old style. Um, and that, I thought that was fantastic. Look, I'll finish up by asking you, look, you, you really were. We've talked about your tenure in two very prominent, very important bands, it must be said. You talked about, you discussed too how you live within the proximity of all of these magnificent musicians. You're one of them, mate. But do, do, you, look, oh, thanks. do you look back and do you feel as though there was a sliding doors moment where life could have unfolded very differently? Uh, no, not really, not really. I made, I don't have any regrets. I made the choices that I made um, at the time. Uh, and I, I, I don't, I don't have any regrets. I, I remember, I mean, not really metal re- related, but the band that I was playing with prior to my retirement, it was just, there was just so much bullshit, you know, with record companies and, no offense journalists and all of this um charade of bullshit i just thought i've had enough and what i wanted to do i wanted to be i wanted to be normal i wanted my brother would phone me up and say look we're going down going into town come and i couldn't because i had to go to london to rehearse or something i really hated the whole uncertainty and how Mm. 
disheveled my life was. I wanted to just have a base. I wanted to start a family. I wanted to be normal and have go to work, come back, get paid. I, wa- I genuinely craved that. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I had I had a couple of children, um, and I've you know I, I enjoy my my work, which obviously takes up most of my time now. Um, and and I'd made that conscious decision, and I I um, you know and, and the other records that we haven't talked about is the Denonicus records, which have just been remastered and re-released mm-hmm. by Andy Larock from uh, King Diamond, which blew my mind. Um, so that those are two records that I really hold in high esteem because that's they're, they're ridiculously heavy and I, at the time of making them i was like oh this is just so fun i can't get my head around it but looking back now <clears throat> blows my mind but yeah to, to answer your question no i i don't really believe in any of that i think that if i'd have um there's a chance i could be uh still playing in bands and being successful but there's also a very high chance that i'd still be playing in bands and just plugging away trying to work out where my next paycheck was coming from and doing anything that would come my way um yeah yeah that's interesting but with it sorry with the denonicus albums um i I can certainly see that it's an entry in your 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 catalog if you like or your your resume but Andy LaRoque, that's a pretty serious person to have come along and actually do some some work with you. How did that happen? Fuck knows. Uh, we did those albums uh, at the turn of the century, so 2000 and, 2000 and 2001, I think, or it might have been 99, I don't know. But I literally, um, Marco messaged me and said, hey, look, they're all being re-released. Andy LaRoque is remastering them all, repackaged new covers. Everything's on Spotify now and Apple Music. Um, and, yeah, good, fantastic. Because, like I said, I, I look back on those records as being real. I really um, – because the way they were recorded was very unique because he would send over a cassette of his guide guitars to a click track. Yep. And literally I would make stuff up over the top of them. So I would write all of the parts. There's a couple of parts where he would say, right, that bit's silent. Don't play on that part. Uh, apart from that, I was left to my own device. And then I'd fly out to Holland, set my drums up, play to the same tape in the studio. Mm. And he would be a surprise. He would be surprised because he would be, he'd have an idea of what I would be playing. But of course, I didn't play what he thought I was going to play. And then, excuse me, the uh, music took shape from there. So it was a really unique way of recording. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I look back on those with, with fond memories and I think that they're, they're definitely the, that's definitely the darkest music I've ever been involved in. So mm. glad to hear it's on Spotify. If it's not on Spotify these days, uh, you're basically hidden. Um, yeah. um that's the other, sorry, sorry to, sorry to bang on Andrew, but that's the other thing. I mean, nowadays in my day, it was a case of you do a demo you send it to a record company, you get signed, you go from there. Nowadays you need a you know, record companies won't even give you a look in unless you've got X amount of followers on Facebook or, or a TikTok following. You know, that to me is just such a, I don't want to sound like an old man, but it's such an alien world. And I can't imagine uh, being uh, a struggling musician in 2022. I, you know, it's, I mean, it's great from a band's perspective in the sense that you can own everything and put it all on your website and sell it and make all of the profit. But you've got to get people to your website. You've got to get people to those gigs. So it's, I, I can't even imagine doing it nowadays. It's, no, it's really like that as a writer, mate. You know, the uh, publishers won't talk to you unless you've got a five figure following yeah. on Facebook. It's fucking stupid. Be like, well, how, Ridiculous. how on earth? I mean, this isn't the be all and end all. Plus, I can go and buy for about for about two hundred dollars. I can go and buy ten thousand followers. You idiots! I mean, there's so many ways exactly. of gaming the system, but I just don't do it. I couldn't be bothered. What's the point? But you know what? I, yeah, what's the point? But I think the way you're doing it um, will prevail. And I and I think that if I was a uh, still a musician, I think that I would do it the way that you know, the old school way. And I think mm. that if it's any good and if there is some substance to it, substance to it, it will come good. You know, I, 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 I think that there is still, you know, some integrity in being 
you know, just doing your own thing for your, for your own reasons, you know, because like you say, you could, you could, if you did do that, you wouldn't be rep- what you would be. You wouldn't be representing you. You know, you'd just be this facade, and it's it's, it's not about that. You know, I think you've just been smart too. If I can make that observation, I mean, what you've talked about, I you could be talking about my life there, where you made a decision that you wanted a proper job, you wanted to have a family. Yeah. These are all things that I had listed as goals when I was a young fella. Thank God I've been able to go down that route. The the idea yeah. that you can everybody can sort of lead the life that Lemmy lived because we all know intimate details about Lemmy's life these days, courtesy of the amount that Buddy Rolling Stone and those fuckhead magazines have written about him. Yeah, um, and you, you read it and think. Man, that's a one-off. That guy was cast from a very different die. The rest of us, mate, if Absolutely. you're not careful, you'll end up on welfare and potentially in a position where you can't recover financially. Absolutely. And as Jordan Peterson talks about, yeah. the, the spiral into hell. Um, you know, broken relationships. You know, not proper, not having proper relationships. Broken relationships with spouses, not having proper relationships with your own children, and God knows whatever else is going on in your own family. But you've got to put in as much effort into that often as you do into the music. It's not just about the music. No, it isn't. It isn't. It's. it's um, <clears throat> and like I said earlier about the whole black metal thing coming into the into the um, the scene, that was something that I couldn't relate to and and music changes all the time um so to having to if you know looking at it from dan's point of view again i mean they've always kind of done their own thing but they've still had to recognize current trends and you know what was you know they had to keep current Mm -hmm. and that whole aspect of (coughs) keeping um up with the times was something that you know I always kind of struggled with, and I think that that would be that would be such pressure, you know. Um, and like I said, there's something to be said for stability. Uh, and once, I mean, the main thing that appealed to me when I was a musician was was seeing the world and and touring. Mm. Um, but touring's fantastic when there's a certain budget behind the band that you're playing with. If there's no budget behind the band you play, it's fucking shit. Yeah. Because you live back in the band and, you know, nobody's looking after you. Um, but when it's slightly a higher level than that, it's, it's fucking wonderful. But yeah, no, like I say, I, I, um, I needed to, to be, I needed stability. I wanted to, it's almost like, right, that phase of my life's done now. What, Let's do something else now, you know. And sometimes I sit here and sometimes I see uh, bands come around and I think, you know, I should, I'd love to get into something again. So I'm never saying never. I'm never, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not adverse to doing something again, but it has to be right. And, and this time it's on my terms. Mm. Uh, but what that looks like, I don't know. If it, if it looks like anything, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll see. at least you've done all the, the, the right things with your life, you know. Um, you know, I can yeah. tell you, mate, I've spoken to musicians who have a lot of deep regrets that they're in their hour, you know, their late 40s. I'm 44, but you know, I can I can sense it, mate. I'm just glad that I've made the decisions that I have made. A lot of the musicians, yeah, totally. you know, spending time in pubs and on tour vans and stuff is pretty cool when you're in your 20s, maybe your 30s, but when you're in your 40s, it's just and you don't have anything to fall back on and you want that exactly. And that's something that you want, mate. I mean, it's very hard to sort of start over again when you're in your late 40s. I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine not having, as you said, you know, something to fall back on. I like um, going out and having a good time and doing whatever, going to gigs, but I love the fact that I'm like, oh, lovely, I'm going to go home and, mm. you know, if I'm, if I'm up past 10, you know, I don't, I like to go to bed. I like to, I've got my routine. I've got, you know, if I've got a day off, then I'm, I like my afternoon naps. You know, I'm a simple guy, you know, I'm <laughs> not, I've got no interest in, in, uh, you know, doing any of that now. So it's, it's weird, but, but yeah, no regrets. I mean, I, I just think, and it's, it's difficult when you talk to people, certainly people that aren't in the scene or aren't um, into, uh, you know, just know the, know the cradle thing and they can't get their heads around it. And they think that, you know, why would you not? It's like, well, it's really not as easy as that. It's not like we're all on fucking you know, X amount of pounds a month. It's, it really isn't like that. And they don't take into, take into 
they don't factor in all the shit that comes with playing in the band. They don't they don't factor factor any of that in. So yeah, they just see the name, think that it's you know all glamour and fucking champagne and cocaine. It's, it's really not. It's just bollocks. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Paula Lind is the one who has the the story around this sort of stuff. Maybe not the cocaine and champagne, maybe, but maybe <laughs> not. But the 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 whole idea of staying in a band for as long as what he did, and then getting to the end of that road, and then you know, looking at your options, that's something that when he's ready to tell that story, I've told him, listen, whether you want to do it, because I write books, so I mentioned mm. um, whether you want to do it via a biography, ghostwriting, help you ghostwrite a biography, or you want to do it more of a documentary style or just even a whole series of conversations like what we're doing here, in addition to the one we've yeah. already done, I'd love to help him with that because he has the story that I think a lot of young musicians I mean, I'll preface what I'm about to say by saying I simply cannot understand if it was what if it was sort of on the way out when you and I were coming through and you actually did it, okay, and I tried to do it. Um, the whole idea that you could join a band, get a deal, boom, you, you're in the next Led Zeppelin, this sort of thing, or the next Faith No More, or whatever it might be. Um, it was on the way out when you and I were coming through, but in 2022 to hear people talk like that, and they're still out there, 19, 20, mm. up to 25 years of age. My only advice for them is, Jesus Christ, you better grow up and you better grow up quick, son, because the music yeah. industry isn't really an industry. It's a meat grinder. Yeah, it is. It is, absolutely. And it's even more of a meat grinder now um, because, uh, hey, do, do you know what, though? I mean, I'd like – it would – I'm just trying to think of all the tools that bands have got at their disposal now, you know, Instagram, TikTok. I'm just trying to think that it's, yeah, fuck that. Seriously, fuck that. These days, you know? all of the bands have all of these tools available. That's the, I even find it as a podcaster. I mean, I'm, I've got killer conversations mm. with you, a killer conversation now with yourself to share with people. That cuts through because nobody else is really doing a lot of that stuff. But even yeah, even absolutely. even my conversations with other members of bands, whether it be Megadeth or what have you, you look at the numbers, they're not there because these people, yeah. they go on these press junkets and boom, it's – and, I mean, I'm not even – It's I'm, the same – Yeah, and, I, look, I can tell you I've earned nothing doing this. I'm not trying to earn money doing it. It's purely for the love and for the passion. No. Uh, that I do this. Yeah. You know, I've got a job, like we say, uh, in the day and day job and, you know, I'm a scout leader and all of this sort of stuff as well. So I've got a pretty well-rounded life, but this is my hobby. Um, yeah. And I think people have got to sort of look yeah. at it that way. And I think your your, your tale, above any, uh, more than anybody else in the group that I've spoken to, sort of highlights that. Yeah. Um, I just... I, I, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, if you, yeah, I mean, I, the idea is to have the, the full time job, the revenue, uh, and then do the band stuff on top of that. But that's difficult to do when you're 20 something. Mm. And then, then one takes over the other because you can't go into work and say, you know what, I can't come in next week because we've got three or four dates to do. It doesn't work like that. So either you need to be, slumming it at home with your parents as a youngster or you need to be you know financially equipped to do it um so yeah it's yeah it's it's it's, it's one of those things though isn't it i mean like i say I'm, I'm i'm grateful for the things that i've done i'm grateful for the experiences that i've had mm. um and the people that i've met you know but yeah it's and I, I like this, things like this are fantastic because I like talking about it, you know, and I think that there's loads of, um, there's so many different little tales kind of spring to you know, thank you for the opportunity, you know, to, to speak about. Well, thank you very much, brother. Uh, truly appreciate it. No worries. Thanks, bro. Nice one. Been a pleasure. Have a good day. You too, mate. No worries. Enjoy your evening. No worries. No. Well, there he is, ladies and gentlemen, was Sargentson. I really appreciate that he was willing to have a chat for the show. If you like that one, and if you're unfamiliar, go across to scarsandguitars.com, click on the link at the top of the page. This is Cradle of Filth Conversations. And you can hear me talk to Stuart Anstis, Nick Barker, Greg Moffat, a.k.a. Damien Gregori, Lindsay Schoolcraft, Danny Filth, Richard Shaw, Ben Ryan, 
Something else, I've written a book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. And yes, the members of Cradle of Filth do feature amongst its pages. Click on the link in the banner if you'd like to try a sample. Go to a marketplace and download. Download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase, do hit me up because I want to thank you personally. On that note, here's some more information about the book. But before I let you go, my name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. And I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all... I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the the fans and the staying power of the... of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>